Early in the 14th century, a Parisian scribe called Nicolas Flamel had a strange dream. In it, an angel appeared and showed him a series of symbols and bizarre pictures. These, he was told, were instructions for creating a magical elixir. This elixir, or potion, had a power so strong that it could turn common or base metals into pure gold. Flamel's dream led him to join a secretive band of men and women who, across time and across the world, devoted their lives to the search for this magical and elusive elixir. They were known as the alchemists. It began with a dream and he had a dream in which an angel presented him with a book filled with nothing but mysterious pictures, no text, just mysterious pictures. Well, sometime later, the story goes, he came across such a book uh, and bought it. The cover of it was engraved with letters or strange figures that I could not read. As to the matter which was written within, it was curiously colored Inside were strange illustrations on 21 leaves, one of them being a cross with a serpent crucified on it. It was his job then to decipher what these symbols meant, and he worked with his wife, Purnell, and allegedly they spent 25 years trying to decipher the secrets of alchemy, how to make base metals into gold. In his quest, Flamel traveled the world, looking for great Jewish mystics from Morocco and Spain who were familiar with many of the bizarre pictures that he was trying to interpret. He obsessively devoted his life to the alchemist's dream. Then, inexplicably, the word spread around France that Flamel had achieved his goal. Finally, I found that which I was seeking. I recognized it by its strong scent and odor. Having found it, I easily accomplished mastery over it and was able to use it. After 25 years of striving, they reportedly achieved success and became wealthy beyond anyone's imagination. And uh, they gave away very large sums of money to churches and hospitals, that sort of thing. Well, legend, of course, has a way of embroidering upon things and stories uh, existed even well after their, their physical deaths that um, they lived on, that they had achieved the immortality of the alchemists and they were seen here and there throughout Europe, you know, a hundred years later. After their death, their house was uh, ransacked by people who hoped to find the alchemical secrets, but uh, if they had the secrets, they died with them. Continued sightings of Flamel, even up to 400 years after his death, fueled the legend of his immortality. These sightings also supported the common belief that the magical substances conjured up by alchemists could not only transmute metals, but might also do strange things to human beings, perhaps even prolong their earthly existence. The guiding wisdom that inspired Nicholas Flamel and his fellow alchemists in Europe came originally from the ancient world. Here, particularly in Egypt, craftsmen developed an art kept secret and regarded with awe and respect. The roots of our Western alchemy uh, date back to the ancient Egyptians. Alchemy really was the precursor to modern-day chemistry. Those ancient alchemists were primarily concerned with procedures for uh, dyeing and bronzing, uh, metal casting, making jewelry, perfumes, uh, cosmetics, those sorts of things, and especially embalming the dead. It was gold the Egyptians most wanted to take with them into their afterlife. 
in all these early societies, gold was extremely important. Obviously because uh, people observed, these people observed that gold did not corrode, it remained perfect all the time. Uh, Egyptian mummies uh, had masks made of gold, undoubtedly because that would, in a sense, give them long liberty. When you go back to the very beginning of alchemy, uh, or one of the beginnings of alchemy, which is um, metal making by the Egyptians, um, they too were interested in making metal look like gold. Because if, if you could make it look like gold, it was gold, it had the qualities of gold. So when the earliest alchemists failed in their quest to magically turn base metals into gold, they applied their skills to creating the next best thing, imitation gold. Other ancient civilizations, the Greeks and the Romans, enthusiastically followed suit, and by the third century, alchemy reached its golden age. At that time, there were so many students of alchemy that an academy was founded by the leading alchemist of the time, Zosimus of Panopolis. Zosimus was the first to teach about a mysterious substance that he called a stone that was not a stone, but which could do wondrous things. Called the Philosopher's Stone, it became a holy grail for alchemists from that time on. Other teaching was based on the simple principle that basic elements could transmute into new substances. For example, when wood was burned, it created water, then smoke, and finally ash. So, the theory went, lead would turn into gold under the right conditions. In reality, the Alchemist's Academy was perhaps the world's first official school of counterfeiting. It was soon so successful that its students were able to flood the market with clever mixtures of copper, lead and gold that were passed off as pure gold. Eventually, at the time of the Roman Emperor Diocletian, the value of real gold plunged so dramatically that he ordered the destruction of all the alchemical texts in the great library of Alexandra. As the books burned, so did many of the alchemical secrets of the Egyptian and classical world. By the 8th century, the center of civilization had shifted to the Arab world. In great intellectual centers such as Baghdad in Iraq or Fez in Morocco, a new spirit of learning and intellectual discourse developed. Here, great works of the classical world were translated, and for 700 years, the cities of the Arab world represented the intellectual cutting edge of the planet. In the schools and universities, the teaching stretched beyond theology to embrace new ideas in mathematics and astronomy. In particular, the Arabs developed the art and science of alchemy. But the search for pure gold still proved elusive. So many Arab alchemists dabbled in other disciplines, including medicine. They experimented with a wide variety of chemicals, metals, sulfurs and salts, and used the latest techniques of distillation and calcination. They continued to believe that they would find gold. Meanwhile, they used the same metals even their favorite mercury, as cures for common illnesses. By the 12th century, their secret art eventually penetrated Europe. At the same time, they enriched the language of science with such words as alcohol, alkali, alembic, elixir, and finally the word alchemy itself, from the Arabic alchemia, the art of melting and alloying metals. When alchemy spread across Europe in the Middle Ages, the church was all-powerful. Because alchemy was more than a simple chemical process, it was considered with great suspicion by Orthodox Christianity. 
It was in the Middle Ages that alchemy took on sort of spiritual dimensions and became a very mysterious process. On one level, the alchemists were seeking to discover this magical formula that would enable them to make gold and silver out of base metals. But the process was intrinsic to their own spiritual development at all. And in fact, the alchemists believed that in order to be able to do this on the mundane level, they had to purify themselves spiritually as well. So the whole process was wrapped up in taking the base material of the soul, the person, with all of its imperfections, and purifying that, going through a lot of changes, and uh, it was not an easy process, but purifying that, and uh, in the process you would become spiritually whole and enlightened. You would achieve the gold of enlightenment. Before self-enlightenment, these early alchemists still believed that somewhere, somehow, they would find a way of concocting a potion that could turn base metals into gold. At the same time, many of them also believed that this potion, now universally called the Philosopher's Stone, would have other wonderful powers and might give them longer lives, or even, like Flamel, immortality. In the West, initially, alchemy consisted out of doing many, many different kinds of manipulations, you know, distillation, burning stuff, you know, boiling stuff, whatever. And people observed uh, that you could make substances like alcohol. Now, al alcohol is obviously an elixir of life. I mean, extraordinary. It looks like water, but look at the stuff it does, the things it does to you, you know. It's a great, uh, undoubtedly, uh, they thought with alcohol they had some success. Such findings brought short-lived and rare fame to the alchemists that used them. In the 13th century, a French alchemist named Arnaldus de Villanova created a startling new brew of alcohol and gold. His potion was so successful that he was summoned by Pope Clement, who thought the Frenchman was on his way to finding the secret of immortality. But it seems his elixir wasn't quite that good. Arnaldus died suddenly on his way to see the Pope. Such unfortunate happenings did little to dampen the ongoing quest by other alchemists across Europe. Of all the early alchemists, the most famous was Paracelsus of Switzerland, whose genius was to have importance far beyond the search for gold. Paracelsus spent his early years experimenting with numerous new and dangerous substances, and like his fellow alchemists, attempted to create gold from base metals. Eventually, however, Paracelsus decided that the art of healing was a more important aim. Men have said of alchemy, he wrote, that it is for the making of gold and silver. For me, that is not the aim, but to consider what virtue and power may lie in medicines. An important phase in this, or an important stage, is Paracelsus, or uh, three plusters bombastus von Hohenheim, you know, very grand name. Now, who, who called himself Paracelsus, I am better than Celsus, this classical doctor. And what he did in the uh, 1500s was to combine alchemy, astrology and medicine f uh, in the surface of uh, medicine, making drugs. And that became known as iatrochemistry. So in other words, instead of trying to make gold or the elixir of life, he used his knowledge and he used the alchemical manipulations of distillation and all the rest. He used that in making drugs. His cures became famous across Europe. He treated epilepsy as a disease instead of as a form of madness. He was the first to diagnose syphilis and treated it with a compound of mercury which was still being prescribed by doctors 400 years later. And he discovered laudanum, an opium derivative that he used as a painkiller.
the 16th century was still a dangerous age for physicians and alchemists alike. Because they were prone to accusations of trickery and witchcraft, they either had to practice in secret, or they had to be prepared to defend their craft vigorously. Paracelsus was perhaps more aggressive than most in his attacks against critics. Let me tell you this. Every little hair on my neck knows more than you and all your scribes. My shoe buckles are more learned and my beard has more experience than all your high colleges. His attacks on fellow scholars and his use of strange medicines made him many enemies. But he saved the lives of the Dutch scholar Erasmus and several other important citizens and so for a while earned their protection. Eventually, after shouting slanderous abuse at the local magistrates, he packed his bags and became a wanderer, dying in poverty at the age of 48 in the Austrian city of Salzburg. Out of necessity, the alchemists became more secretive. Occasionally, though, a notable public figure would lend credence to their craft. The great 17th century scientist Robert Boyle took a keen interest in alchemy. The British scientist was noted as one of the creators of chemistry as we now know it. He was credited, along with a German assistant, as the discoverer of a new strange substance called phosphorus. Among the papers left after his death was evidence of his secret preoccupation with alchemy. One of the discovered documents was an alchemical text written in a code that no one has yet been able to break. Today, scholars are still trying to unravel its mysteries, including researchers at the John Hopkins University in the United States. They are working with several thousand pages of Boyle's notes. So far, they defy comprehension. Part of the problem is that the alchemist's craft was not solely a matter of mixing chemicals together in the search of an elusive elixir. It also involved complex symbols and rituals alchemists didn't just see their materials as compounds reacting. They were that very much so, but they also represented other things to the alchemist, whether it was purely for metaphor or for spiritual purposes, religious or theological purposes. It could be a wide range of things. That's absent, of course, now in modern chemistry, but it was very present for the alchemists. So just as codes were used to disguise the alchemist's notes, so its pictorial language was filled with hidden meanings. Meanings that were devised by the ancients and carried forward by generations of new alchemists. Symbols such as the sun, strange mythological animals and kings and queens were common and had power when interpreted correctly. The knowledge of the alchemist was passed on by word of mouth, but also by texts that was written in a very uh, uh, codified way, very secret way, but also through pictures. The pictures are extremely important, of course very ambiguous the pictures are, and in fact there are alchemical texts that only have pictures, that have no words at all. Now, so the only way you can learn uh, what's going on there is to come to a person like me, the alchemist, to explain to you what is going on in these pictures. Throughout the ages, alchemists used the same symbols and designs as part of a secret code. They also used special colors. Uh, red stands for the sun and uh, white or silver for the moon. And the moon and the sun together are two extremely important symbols in alchemy. And in many of the alchemical pictures, for instance, you see the two marrying, the two coming together, the conjunction of both, that then gives you the Philosopher's Stone, which is perfection. Now the colors they were observing uh, were as follows, and they became very significant. Black was the, the, the lowest of the colors, that's death. The next color was uh, white, and then the final color was red. Alchemy, I think, as a remarkably consistent set of images and pictures and details of language from the earliest times in about the third century AD right up to the end of the 17th century. 
It's concerned from its beginnings to its end with religion, with images of growth and progression, and with the allegorical interpretation of mythology. I think there's a long-standing belief in Western thought that important truths, religious truths, significant truths, are best expressed in difficult language, so we might the better appreciate their importance. And alchemy in its written language and in its visual pictures often uses images which are quite bizarre to us now, violent images, disturbing images, rather surreal ones. One of the most spectacularly beautiful series of alchemical images is that in a very precious British Library manuscript, one of the British Library's treasures. It's called Splendor Solis, the Splendor of the Sun, and it contains 22 coloured illustrations which very enigmatically and curiously express to us the alchemical process. Here's the first one. We can see an alchemist right at the beginning of his process, and the scroll above him reads, let us go in search of the nature of the four elements. Other mystics adopted many of the symbols of alchemy for their own purposes, some ending up on popular fortune-telling cards called tarot. Alchemy as a spiritual uh, discipline arose in the Middle Ages, about the 1200s, and of course we have the tarot coming into existence perhaps a couple of centuries after that. There are alchemical symbols I I within the tarot. The images themselves have alchemical significance. The first uh, tarot deck that we have in existence is dated to the middle 1400s. These cards may have originally been intended as teaching devices, mnemonic devices for teaching about virtues, for example, or portraying uh, certain types of pr cl uh, classes of people in, in society. Um, by the 1700s, they, these cards had become the tarot and they were used in divination parlor games. There are many ways to use the tarot. The most uh, popular method is to lay them out in a pattern, and each position in the card has a meaning. And in turn, each card has its own meaning, separate from the pattern, and you blend the two together. Uh, many of these meanings are alchemical in nature, which uh, lends evidence to the idea that persons knowledgeable about alchemy were involved in the development of the tarot. For example, if you took a deck of cards and just pulled one out, uh, let's say you pulled out the death card. Well, many people think that this is a literal death, that the card is an omen, uh, some sort of uh, warning that someone is about to die. Actually, it's, it's really symbolic and it's very alchemical because the death card relates to change, the death of the old to make way for the birth of the new. Not surprisingly, the alchemical symbol of death features strongly in the extraordinary architecture of Prague. In the 15th and 16th centuries, Prague became a mecca for alchemists from all over the world. They left evidence of their craft on buildings throughout the city. It was a city that had a reputation for its scholarship, its music, poetry and science. Before long, it attracted Europe's most famous alchemists. Across most of Europe at this time, mystics and diviners such as Nostradamus or alchemists like Paracelsus were regarded with great suspicion, particularly by the church whose influence on the kings, princes and rulers of Europe was extremely powerful. But Prague was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, and emperors who ruled there held sway over the local clergy. In the 16th century, they were able to counter the disapproval that the church leveled against mystics and alchemists to indulge their own fascination with these subjects. 
Alchemists who came to Prague could escape the fear of religious persecution. Still, failure to produce gold could easily end in dire punishment. But if there was a promise of success, the alchemists were offered a regal welcome and lived a sumptuous existence at court. Lording over this alchemical renaissance was Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, the King of Bavaria and ruler of Austria. Described as a sage clown and mad poet, he welcomed the alchemists and, more importantly, financed their dreams. Rudolf was a compulsive collector of oddities from all over the world. His rooms were stuffed with chalices for boiling poisons, soil from the Hebron Valley from which God was reputed to have formed Adam, thousands of clocks, globes made by the greatest map makers of Europe, and a vast collection of books covering the whole of contemporary science and the occult, a subject that fascinated him all his life. Rudolf II did not only attract um, alchemists to his court, but also silversmiths, goldsmiths, all sorts of different craftsmen, including painters. He loved paintings. And one particular painter was Archimboldo, uh, who produced uh, paintings, um, faces, portraits, uh, using fruit, uh, you know, of, um, fishes. One of them has fishes. 65 species of fishes makes a face. And he too was interested in alchemy, so even the color of his painting has an alchemical symbol in it because, for instance, he's done one painting of Rudolf II um, using noble flowers in the face and weeds down below and there's a red hue, the whole painting has a red hue because red is a noble color. Into this colourful environment came as many seekers of truth as frauds and tricksters. At any one time as many as 200 alchemists could be found plying their craft in Rudolf's court, vying with each other for fame and fortune. Rudolf housed them on a special street, still known today as the Street of Alchemists. Lodging here at the end of the 16th century was John Dee, one-time astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I of England. His honorable career was brought crashing down through his association with the alchemical fraud, Edward Kelly. At the same time, of course, you had the greedy alchemist, the bad alchemist, people like uh, Edward Kelly, uh, who, who uh, teamed up with um, the mystic uh, John Dee. Uh, in fact, they teamed up so thoroughly that they even uh, shared wives which they thought was part, which would better their alchemical process, procedures. Anyway, they went to the Mecca of alchemy, which was Rudolf II in Prague. Rudolf II was interested in all aspects of alchemy, the metaphysical and the spiritual side, but also the side that would give him money, the making of gold. Uh, John Dee and uh, Edward Kelly were two of many, many alchemists who went, ended up in that court, and of course, uh, Gold was never made. Many, of course, thought that they had made gold. At other times, of course, it was complete fraud. Edward Kelly had already been caught out in England for producing fake coins and had been imprisoned and tortured there. But he managed to charm and trick himself into Rudolf's favor, being knighted and given scope to provide Rudolf with the much-promised gold. Before long, he was pressed for results and resorted to his old trickery. hollowed out coal and in this hollowed out coal he put some gold.
uh, gold granules. So then when he did his uh, alchemical process in front of Rudolf II, of course, gold came out. <laughs> but the gold was already there, in fact. Um, then, of course, the trick is, ah, look, I've made some gold. Now, if you give me plenty of uh, money, I can make you 60 times as much or 100 times as much, you see. How long will it take you to do that? Oh, I need a year for that. So you have a, free, a year's free board and lodgings. And, of course, you, you sneak out. You sneak away from the court, you know. <laughs> For all his support of the alchemists, the Emperor Rudolf had limited patience. Many a trickster, fraud or failure found himself languishing in the Prague castle dungeon. Eventually it was Kelly's turn and his time and luck ran out. Before he could perform a disappearing act, Rudolf had him thrown into prison, where he later died. Across Europe, during this same period, other alchemists, whose attempts had likewise failed, found themselves burned, hanged or imprisoned. One such trickster, a colleague of Kelly's, was strung up on yellow rope and clothed in tinsel as a warning to others. Despite all his encouragement, investment and energies, Rudolf never got the gold he so desperately sought. Although centuries later, archaeologists made a strange discovery that Rudolf no doubt would have enjoyed immensely. While excavating his tomb in Prague in recent years, archaeologists found the contents in a remarkably good state of preservation. Oddly, however, the red clothes in which he was said to have been buried were all found to be coloured gold. The death of Rudolf by no means spelt the end of alchemy. In England, its most famous new advocate was also a famous scientist. This is the best known apple tree in the world. In 1666, it dropped an apple, so the legend goes, at the feet of a young man sitting in his mother's garden in Cambridge. That apple caused the young Isaac Newton to start a train of thought that led to his theories on gravity. By the age of 24, Newton had become the foremost mathematician in Europe. He had laid the foundations for his book, Principia Mathematica, which would make him world famous. In his mother's rooms, he also carried out experiments on the nature of light, using prisms. His work with light and gravity were subjects he lectured about for the rest of his long and distinguished life. But there is another side of Newton, little talked about in modern science books. He was a closet alchemist. Looking back on it from the 20th century, alchemy seems to be an unusual pursuit for a person like Newton. But if you put him, yourself in his shoes as a 17th century natural philosopher, alchemy is part of the world. It's a part of knowledge that is to be pursued and understood. For Newton in particular, alchemy had special meaning because Newton was convinced that there was something called a prisca sapientia, an ancient knowledge that had been given by God either to Adam or to his sons and been transmitted from father to son. This knowledge had since become corrupted. So if we wanted to know as much as we could about the natural world, what better way to get it than from God's own words? So in order to get those, we had to reconstitute the prisca sapientia, the ancient wisdom. And alchemy was one way of doing this, he thought. Newton collected more than 200 alchemical texts from around the world to help with his private experiments and research. What you must remember that in the 17th century, 
all educated people were interested in, in alchemy one way or another. Even someone like Newton wrote more on alchemy than on anything else. He wrote more than a million words on alchemy. He spent 30 years in his private laboratory trying out all these ancient recipes. Never got them anywhere, but he did. When he died, uh, the stature of Newton was so great, and by then alchemy had declined to such an extent, his family thought his reputation would be besmirched if people knew of his alchemical interest. So they suppressed all these documents for the next 150 odd years. One of the last great scientists to try and revive alchemy was the respectable and brilliant young English chemist, James Price. In 1782, after some years of work in his private laboratory, Price claimed to have developed a white powder which was capable of converting 50 times its own weight into silver, and a red powder which could convert 60 times its weight into gold. He demonstrated his process to a number of distinguished scientists. His experiments became so famous that they were translated into seven different languages. Samples of his gold were shown to King George III of England. But his colleagues in England were harder to impress, and the leading scientist of the time, Sir Joseph Banks, insisted that Price uphold the honor of science by demonstrating his claims in front of an impartial team of experts. In August 1783, three experts traveled down to Price's house to watch his experiment. Price received his visitors calmly, again making preparations to demonstrate his alchemical powders. As they were checking his procedures, he swallowed cherry laurel water, a very deadly poison. He promptly collapsed and died. He is buried in a local church, and on his memorial stone is written, Oh, how mistaken he was. Alchemy seems to have died out, not all at once, but sequentially in different countries. We find it lasting in Germany, for example, until the 1780s, even the 1790s, there are some pro-alchemical works being printed. We find in France and England, however, that by the 1730s, it's being laughed at. By the 1740s, it's dead. Alchemy had fallen into disuse, really, for the last 300 years. No one really understood the symbols, and it was generally dismissed as a bunch of people trying to, to take a quick cut of getting rich and transforming lead into gold. In other words, it was understood wholly in outer terms and, and laughed at, really. One might suppose that as the age of scientific reasons swept the world, alchemy would be consigned to quaint historical oblivion. But surprisingly, it flourished beyond the 18th century in unexpected ways. As in the 14th century, Nicolas Flamel had been inspired by his dreams and propelled into an alchemical world, so too in the 20th century was a leading Swiss psychiatrist named Carl Jung. Carl Jung became very interested in alchemy uh, through his own dreams, in fact. And that's also very interesting because dreams were one of the primary media of the alchemists. They derived their inspirations from dreams and visions. And um, they were very mysterious about their discoveries. They didn't write things down in text. They recorded it in pictures and symbols. One night, Jung had a dream that was to change his life. It was a dream, and it kept coming to him, of himself being in a house and discovering an extra wing. And 
he would go walking in the wing of this house and he found a magnificent library there with symbols that he couldn't understand but which fascinated him. And then he was offered a book on alchemy and he said, good Lord, what nonsense, how could anyone make sense of this? But on the other hand, his patients kept bringing him dreams that he couldn't understand, dreams of eagles that flew in both directions and dreams of a woman standing on a globe. And this intrigued him so much that he picked up a text and looked at it but made no sense of it. And then suddenly it dawned on him that they were working in symbols. And this so delighted him because he felt that, well, then they belong to the tradition of the human spirit because he, his studies in myth had prepared him to think symbolically. And in fact, he considered this was essential to understand our unconscious life and our dreams. It was a long while before I found a way about in the labyrinth of alchemical thought processes. Reading the 16th century text, I noticed that certain symbols were frequently repeated. But I couldn't make out what their sense was. It was as if I were trying to solve a riddle of an unknown language. It was a task that kept me absorbed for more than a decade. Dreams are very important in alchemy. Uh, for one reason, they were the, one of the primary means of inspiration for the alchemists. The alchemists relied very heavily upon getting uh, secret wisdom from their dreams, getting revelations. And uh, dreams are comprised of mysterious symbols in themselves. Dreams are unto themselves alchemical. We have dreams uh, every night and they're filled with mysterious images. Many times we don't know what they mean. And that was the milieu of the alchemists. They worked with strange symbols that very few people know what they knew what they meant. Well, Jung saw a similarity between the dreams of his patients and the symbols of alchemy. Even though his patients had never heard of alchemy or knew what any of these symbols were, they matched images from alchemical texts. And um, the meaning that these dreams had also seemed to match the alchemical import of these, these old symbols. Jung was delighted to find during his research that the work of ancient Chinese alchemists coincided with his own. It was with some excitement that he realized that Oriental alchemy had stayed vibrant and unchanged through the centuries, unlike Western alchemy. Long before the first European alchemists began building their secret laboratories, magicians and mystics in ancient China were convinced of their powers to create gold from other substances. Their claims of success grew in extravagance. In the second century BC, one master alchemist at the court of the emperor Wu Ti announced, I know how cinnabar transforms its nature and passes into gold. I can ride the flying dragon and visit the extremities of earth. I can bestride the crane and soar above the nine degrees of heaven. If you will make sacrifice to the furnace, you too will be able to transmute cinnabar into gold. The Chinese alchemists claimed that the gold they created through alchemy could also have wonderful benefits for the human body. The earliest Chinese alchemists recommended that people should drink gold. Like, can you imagine it, drinking potable gold? And then shortly after that they also recommended people to drink substances that looked like gold. And God knows how many people were killed drinking this stuff. In, in China, they moved away from drinking gold to becoming interested in doing exercises to get long liberty that way. Uh, I suppose you could say this is the origin of, of yoga in the sense, these sort of exercises. The shift from finding gold to finding immortality was an important distinction between Eastern alchemy and that of the West. The Eastern uh, tradition of alchemy, the Chinese, um, was 
aimed at achieving immortality and it also involved purification that you had to purify yourself to a higher level to attain an immortality of existence and there were mysterious elixirs and processes um, breathing processes and physical exercises that one went through to um, get this eternal this eternal essence so that you would achieve this immortal state of existence and it was from China that alchemical ideas and philosophy spread along the ancient trade routes into the heart of India. Nearly 2,000 years ago, alchemists in the far south of India, in Tamil Nadu, used gold, or substances believed to be gold, as part of a magical process towards creating immortality. One of the oldest prayers to come from this time says, Gold born from fire, long lived becomes he who wears it. Remarkably, the process devised by the ancient Indian alchemists has continued to this day. The magical elixir of the alchemists can only be prepared once a year at a secret site. The site is the only place where one of the vital ingredients for their potion can be found. The alchemist seeks a powder that only appears on the surface of the earth on only one night in the year. It needs the full moon and is most visible at midnight. The powder he collects is called Paneru. Alchemists believe it is drawn from under the ground to the Earth's surface by the gravitational pull of the moon. Panero becomes an essential ingredient of their potion. The mixture includes potentially harmful metals such as mercury, silver, zinc and lead. The Indian alchemists believe that the Panero removes all dangerous effects from the alchemical process and the final elixir can then be taken as a means of lengthening life. and Asia there are alchemists who believe that the dreams of the ancient alchemists were not wrong they just haven't been fulfilled yet in Europe the dreams have changed but even there the ancient alchemist and the modern scientist may have found common ground one of the key beliefs of the alchemist was transmutation that is to turn uh, a less noble metal into gold and of course, in a strange sort of way, that's what we do today. I mean, modern physics, we can do transmutation. Uh, we can turn one element into another. Uh, so in a, in a strange, so in an ironical sort of way, the, the alchemist was right. <laughs> 